Today, my dear brothers and sisters, we celebrate the memorial of blessed John Dun Scotus, who was a Franciscan theologian. He was responsible for coming up with the theological definition and reasoning as to why we could say that Mary was conceived without stain or blemish. So he's the champion of the Immaculate Conception. His theology was often not understood. In fact, they call him the subtle doctor. So misunderstood was he at times that his rivals, the Dominicans, would make fun of him. And in fact, in their classrooms, the one who they considered to be the, you know, what's the word there? When, when somebody's not too bright and they're in school, what do you call them? Dunce. Dunce. Right. So I ask you, if you're Franciscan at heart, never to use that word because that word comes from John Dun Scotus. They would use, they would call, they would call the, the not so bright student in their classroom, they would call him Dunce after John Dun Scotus, and they would give them a hat to mock John Dun Scotus's hat, the Dunce cap. Imagine that, being that misunderstood, and yet he continued to allow himself even to be misunderstood and to even face persecution at times. Brothers and sisters, I believe sometimes the gospel can be subtle. The message that we receive can be a little subtle. Kind of like John Dunscotus's theology. It takes sometimes some chewing, some, some mulling over things. In the first reading that we have today, from St. Paul to the Philippians, we hear him saying something that maybe, maybe kind of passes us by a bit, that, that's a little bit subtle. This is what he says. Let me get to the right page. We are the circumcision who worship through the Spirit of God, who boast in Christ Jesus and do not put our confidence in flesh, although I myself have grounds for confidence even in the flesh. He's talking to the Philippians about people who were saying that you had to do certain actions. You had to be circumcised in order to be saved. So they were putting confidence in their actions, in fulfilling the works of the law. And he's saying, you know what, that's not, that's not the case. We can't boast in what we do. If we boast in what we do, what ends up happening is this. We begin to compare. We begin to say, well, I do X, Y, Z, but I notice that these people, they don't do X, Y, Z. And then pride subtly gets in there, and all of a sudden we're judging people, and we're backbiting them. And then the devil is just delighting in it because maybe we're even doing it as we compare, pe- compare ourselves religiously, which is what was going on in the time of Paul. And the, and the Philippians. So he's saying we don't put confidence in the flesh. You know, he's saying, listen, you know, according to the spiritual blessings that have come down through the Jewish people, I have this right to be, to be considered such, you know, such a righteous person if I'm only putting my righteousness and my, and my thought about the flesh. Because look, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I'm, I'm an Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew parentage. I'm not a convert. I'm a cradle Jew. I was a Pharisee. I even persecuted the church because I thought the church was wrong, he's saying. That's how zealous he was for the law. In righteousness based on the law, I was blameless. He was a daily mass attendee. He didn't miss a a holy day of obligation according to Jewish law. He did everything. Then he began to realize that that it was himself putting his confidence in his own ability to save himself. And when he realizes this, and he realizes it, he realized it encountering Jesus on the road to Damascus. 
And in coming to know Jesus Christ, he began to realize all of the stuff that he was doing was building up pride and a confidence in something that couldn't save himself. And suddenly he says, I've come to know Christ. I've come to know the righteousness that comes from him, not a righteousness of my own, but a righteousness that comes from him. And so, brothers and sisters, we we can see, you know, God is actually pleased with us when we are willing to say, I'm wrong. We begin every single Mass, and we take this time. And, you know, and I, and I I blame us priests sometimes. We're supposed to take time to reflect and to call to mind our sins, to let the Holy Spirit convict us, not to condemn us, not, not, not for us to like beat ourselves up as if we could like somehow curry favor with God the more we beat ourselves up. God doesn't want that either. He just wants us to be open to being corrected. He wants us open to recognizing that hey, maybe we got it wrong. Maybe yesterday we got it wrong. Maybe the day before we got it wrong. And maybe God just wants to show us, look, here... Here's a way. And then that way, when we begin to do things that the Lord wants us to do, we can realize, if it wasn't for the Lord, I wouldn't be doing the right thing anyway. And then we're not putting our confidence in our own righteousness, but our confidence in God, who has promised to teach us, promised to show us the way. And as subtle as that may be, that's an important and powerful message. That even that when, we, when we stop trying to make ourselves righteous, when we stop trying to justify ourselves, and we let Jesus be the one to guide us and to correct us, well then, there's a big party in heaven. We heard that in the gospel. There's more joy in heaven over one person who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. That's got to boggle the mind. How could God be more pleased with people who get it wrong and repent than people who don't ever think they get it wrong and never repent? Maybe it's because he knows that the people who think they never get it wrong do sometimes. So we ask Blessed John Duns Scotus to pray for us today that we might be willing specifically to enter into the subtlety of the gospel, the subtlety of that message of it's not about our good works on their own so that we could compare ourselves and judge ourselves compared to others, but rather it's this, It's rejoicing that we have a Savior who forgives sinners. That's good news, because that's all of us. It's rejoicing in that, and it's coming to the Lord, and it's learning from Him, even if that means daily. Daily coming to the Lord, saying, Oh, ah, Lord, I did it again, I messed up again. And God's saying, that's okay, I'm glad you're at least willing to admit you messed up again. Now I can teach you. Thank you.